Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about how to suspect dead space and how to measure it. Suspicion for alveolar dead space can be very difficult and often we think about dead space physiology when we talk about obstructive diseases like COPD and asthma. Though you have to understand that hypercapnia in these obstructive diseases are caused by many other reasons as well. You would think about dead space is if your patient respiratory rates are pretty high and your patient is still hypercapnic. That means he's wasting a lot of ventilation. Though this can also be present because of increased CO reproduction by increased work of breathing. One of the things that you have to pay attention to that increased alveolar dead space doesn't always causes hypercapnia. For example, in acute pulmonary embolism, these guys will rarely present as hypercapnia as their minute ventilation is stimulated both by hypercapnia and hypoxia. If you want to understand a bit about this, look at the link below why COPD causes hypercapnia. Radiology is a much easier way to figure out if you're dealing with dead space physiology. You can look at the hyperinflation on chest x-ray, such as seen in COPD or COPD exacerbations. The bullous lesion in COPD are epitome of dead space. Hyperlucency on x-ray and oligemia on chest x-ray can be seen in acute pulmonary embolism, though these are much rarer to observe. In ICU, the things are a little easier because your patient is on a ventilator. On a ventilator, if you see that PaCO2 is increasing and there is no change in minute ventilation, that would mean that you are possibly dealing with increased alveolar dead space. And if your minute ventilation remains same, that means the relatively alveolar ventilation has dropped and alveolar dead space has increased. However, it can also be seen if there is increased CO2 production. Other way to suspect this is if your PaCO2 doesn't improve as expected with increasing the respiratory rate. You know that PaCO2 is inversely proportional to alveolar ventilation. So if you double up the respiratory rate, your PSU2 should drop by half. However, if you are having alveolar dead space issues, your denominator is much lower, so your PSU2 doesn't improve as expected despite increasing the respiratory rate. Using a volumetric capnogram along with an arterial blood gas can help you figure out if you have alveolar dead space. And in this situation, what you are noting is your entitled CO2 does not reach P arterial CO2. So next question comes is how much alveolar dead space are you dealing with? And for this, you have to look at your volumetric capnography. And we talked about volumetric capnogram in my previous lecture. So please go ahead and review that. Let's understand some of these terms a little bit more clearly. We have got P capital A CO2 and P small a CO2. The capital A stands for the alveolar CO2 and small stands for the arterial CO2. So the P alveolar CO2 is the CO2 concentration in the alveoli and P arterial CO2 is the what you measure in your arterial ABG. For clarity, we'll call the P alveolar CO2 as P ALV CO2 just to make the things easier for you. P arterial CO2 is slightly higher than P alveolar CO2 by 2 to 3 millimeters of mercury because there is always some anatomical shunts available. Even with around 50% of shunts, the P CO2 is higher than P alveolar CO2 but only by 5 to 6 millimeters of mercury. And we'll see the importance of this in subsequent slides. The other two terms are P small e CO2 and P capital E CO2. The small e CO2 stands for the entitled CO2. That means the highest amount of CO2 that is measured on the capnogram at end expiration. P capital E CO2 is the end expiratory CO2, which is the average of CO2 in the exhaled air. For simplicity, we'll call our entitled CO2 as P ET CO2 so that it's easier for you. In a normal capnogram, the end titles, that means the last portion of CO2 that is sensed by the CO2 sensor, will be equal to the P alveolar CO2. 
since you do not have much alveolar dead space, your average P alveolar CO2, that means combination of this green area and the white area, should be equal to the P alveolar CO2. If your phase 3 is horizontal, P antidal is equal to your P alveolar CO2 and your mean P alveolar CO2. The PeCO2, that's your end expiratory, is the average of the carbon dioxide if you exhaled out. So PeCO2 is the average of CO2 in this anatomical dead space and your P alveolar CO2. In a way, this blue area is your alveolar ventilation, that is carbon dioxide, and you have anatomical dead space, which has no CO2. And if you draw a line where the area of this rectangle is equal to the area of this rectangle, the horizontal line would give you PeCO2. When you exhale out your air into a balloon, say for example, Douglas bag, you can measure the fraction of CO2 in the, in the bag and you will know the tidal volumes. You can figure out your fraction of alveolar CO2 from your capnogram. Total amount of CO2 in your Douglas bag is your tidal volume multiplied by the CO2 in the expired air and this will be equal to the total CO2 in your dead space and total CO2 in your alveolar space. Since your CO2 in the dead space is zero, so your equation simplifies out to tidal volume multiplied by the CO2 in the expired air is equal to the volume of alveolar space and amount of CO2 in your alveolar space. And since your alveolar space is nothing but tidal volume minus dead space, you can get to the next step of the equation. We know that the fraction of CO2 is proportional to the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli and in the back. So you can replace your fraction of CO2 to a partial pressure of CO2. And when you rearrange this equation, Vd by Vt equals P alveolar CO2 minus P end expiratory CO2 divided by the P alveolar CO2. This is the Bohr's formula that you would commonly see in the textbooks. Now let's understand this a little bit more intuitively. So we have alveolar volume in this beaker and you have a dead space volume. And when you exhale, this is your dead space portion. This is your alveolar portion and combination will be your tidal volume. The average of the CO2 now would be your fraction of CO2 in expired air. The total number of CO2 molecules will be equal on both sides. Hence, your amount of CO2 molecules in this left-hand side will be equal to the fraction of alveolar CO2 multiplied by the volume and similarly F expired CO2 into tidal volume. You know your tidal volumes. You can measure fraction of CO2 in your expired air and you can measure fraction of alveolar CO2 as this will be equal to your arterial CO2. The only unknown left is your how much of your tidal volume went to the alveoli and how much went to dead space. So if you simplify this equation, Va by Vt will be equal to F expired CO2 by F alveolar CO2. And if you replace the alveolar volume with Vt minus Vd, you should come back to Bohr's formula, that's Vd by Vt equals P alveolar CO2 minus P expired CO2 by P alveolar CO2. However, in many pulmonary diseases, it's very difficult to calculate the P alveolar CO2. For example, diseases like as COPD, you can have shark fin appearance and you don't know where your entitle is as your CO2 continues to rise and you don't know where this entitle will end up with. So Angoff made an assumption that your P arterial CO2 is approximately to P alveolar CO2 and this fits most of the conditions. As you already know that P arterial CO2 is only 2 to 3 millimeters mercury higher than P alveolar CO2. Even in patients with pretty large shunts, your P arterial CO2 is higher by 5 to 6 points when compared to P alveolar CO2. So this is a decent approximation even in these extreme situations. 
So your VD by VT can be written as P arterial CO2 minus P end expiratory CO2 divided by P arterial CO2. So if you have to calculate a dead space from an ABG, when your P CO2 is around 50, that should be approximately equal to your P alveolar CO2. And if you can get your P end expiratory CO2 from your ventilator, say for it's 25, your total dead space fraction will be 50 minus 25 divided by 50, that's 50%. 50 Note that P end expiratory CO2 and P end tidal CO2 are very different numbers. And we'll understand the nuances of P end tidal CO2 in our next lecture, where we figure out how to calculate alveolar and anatomical dead spaces. In summary, you think about dead space if your patient has high minute ventilation and is still hypercapnic. If your PUCO2 doesn't improve as expected with increasing respiratory rates, and if your P arterial CO2 is more than end tidal CO2, use your capnogram to figure out magnitude of dead space. You can use Enghoff's modification of pore equation, which gives you a very good approximation of dead space. And in the next lecture, we'll learn to how to differentiate anatomical and alveolar dead space components. Thank you. <music>